Speaking truth and power, unlocking minds, one day at a time, day at a time. Speaking truth and power, unlocking minds, one day at a time, day at a time. Truth of the matter, is that truth really matters? Yeah. Truth of the matter, is that truth really matters? Yeah. In the beginning, I was back and forth like bad men. Lacking wisdom, no direction for proper decisions I heard my bro had a show, so I started to listen Truth of the matter, ain't no comparing the competition The kid feeling blessed, cause it's clear as when Dex After talking with Dex, I know just where to step I know the pack gon' be narrow, but my eyes on the sparrow And the truth of the matter is that truth really matters Truth of the matter, that truth really matters Hey, <laughs> truth of the matter and well, good evening, everybody. I want to say thank you all once again uh, for joining me uh, in part three, for part three of this conversation, overcoming the epidemic of fatherlessness. Listen, I believe that this is a vital conversation, and I would ask that if this has been uh, something that has been impactful for you, you've been learning from these uh, lessons, uh, I would ask that you would share uh, not only tonight's message with someone else, but uh, even go back into uh, part one and part two, share those. Uh, and as you know, uh, we are actually coming from the book entitled uh, Dear Son, The Words of a Father to the Heart of a Son. Uh, this is a book that I actually released uh, last year this time, close to Father's Day. And so wanted to uh, actually kind of dive into why uh, I wrote the book. Uh, but not only why I wrote the book, but how it relates to us as men, because I, I need to qualify this by saying, uh, you know, why why is it that I keep calling this a necessary co conversation? And so I hope that what we've been going over over these last three weeks uh, is really serving as a, a reason um, for why this book is of value, but also this series. Uh, it's my hope that uh, men are, are, are really getting the healing. Uh, that they need. And I know that the language of healing is not always uh, something that, uh, you know, touches us as men. And it's not something that always makes sense. Uh, but that does not negate the fact that it's needed. Uh, I'll start this off by saying that uh, not only am I a father, I'm also a son. Uh, and I also interact with males, young and old, on an everyday basis. I do a lot of stuff in my community. Uh, I was able and fortunate to have found a non a nonprofit last year, uh, a mentoring company, uh, a mentoring agency, where we provide mentoring services to at-risk youth, and 90% uh, of those youth are males. And so uh, I can't overstate uh, how you know many men deal with father wounds, uh, because like I said, you know, I, I interact with young males, I interact with older men. I'm also uh, a volunteer in the prison system. Uh, and you'll be surprised how consistent the conversation sounds amongst uh, the diversity of men and, and young men that I interact with. And so I'll say this, that, you know, women are not the only ones uh, with daddy issues. Uh, it just looks differently uh, for us as men. Um, as men, I want to encourage you all, uh, we have to examine the imprint that our father left. Uh, whether good, bad, or indifferent, uh, the imprint motivates us in some capacity. Uh, whether you told yourself that you'll never be, you don't want to be anything like your father, or whether you want to be just like him, uh, you know, that is uh, indicative of the imprint that your father left. And so once again, I hope that this series is serving as a catalyst uh, to getting that healing process initiated. Uh, last week, we discussed the impacts of the emotionally unavailable father. Uh, we said that fatherlessness is not just the physical absence of a father, uh, but in many instances, the emotionally unavailable father uh, can be just as detrimental as the father who is not present. Uh, and the reason why we said that is, is that the, the unemotionally available father, what they do is they rationalize to themselves uh, that their being around is enough. Uh, they tell themselves that, you know what, my being here should be proof 
that I love you, even though it's not widely expressed. It's just if you see me, that should serve as a uh, a message to you uh, that, you know, the love is indeed there. Uh, however, I want to say this is that uh, the emotional disconnect makes them what I like to call the familiar stranger. Uh, you know who they are by physical recognition, but the reality is, is that you don't really know who they are. Uh, and ultimately what happens in this instance is that their voice begins to sound foreign. And in many instances, it begins to sound confrontational uh, because you don't uh, really know the language. You don't really know them from the state of being emotionally present. Uh, it can be misconstrued as them being aggressive uh, and confrontational when they do choose to engage with you. And so that's one of the dangers of having a, an emotionally unavailable father. Uh, another danger as it relates to having an emotionally unavailable father, uh, the child grows up to question their worth because of the absence of validation. Uh, and they learn to accept this as a norm because of the demonstration provided by the father. Now, tonight, uh, we're not going to specifically address a father type. Uh, but what we will do is we'll talk about learned behaviors um, that ultimately uh, I've acknowledged. I would say that about 70 percent of the men, at least that I deal with, uh, you know, th this is an issue that is uh, a recurring theme in their lives. And I would say that that issue is anger and anger management. One of the things that I think uh, we rarely give attention to. Uh, is how do we come to accepting certain behaviors and norms? How do we how do we come to recognizing that these are just things that we do? Uh, for the most part, uh, as men, uh, it's widely expected and understood that a uh, part of our role is to be the defender of the home, uh, we're to be the provider, uh, and I believe that for the most part, you know, this can be attributed to our inherited masculinity. Uh, however, uh, the means in which uh, we learn certain life lessons and social norms play a big part in the men that we become. Um, if we're honest, a lot of our beliefs have been shaped by trauma. Uh, the pain of certain events, uh, whether it be physical, emotional, uh, financial, uh, you name it, uh, you know, the pain of those events were so impactful uh, that we vow to ourselves uh, that we would never find ourselves in those type of positions again. And listen, I'm not here sitting, uh, sitting here saying that there's no value in this type of motivation. Um, you know, there, there are certain things that even a, as a, an adult male um, that, you know, there's experiences that I've encountered in my adulthood that I've told myself, you know, what, I would never find myself in that situation again. And ultimately, what I've done is created systems to safeguard me from finding myself in those positions. Uh, ideally, I'm speaking of maybe some monetary financial positions that, you know, I found myself in a bad place and, and created some systems that I wouldn't be there again. Uh, but what I'm saying is, is that uh, a lot of us come to these conclusions, these hard conclusions, uh, they're formed as children. In many of uh, in many instances, this is no fault of the child. You know, this is no fault of our own that we've come to these conclusions. Uh, and so, you know, whatever that traumatic experience is, uh, you know, you can you can place a name on it. Uh, however, uh, to the degree of which has impacted you, you know what it is. And as a child, you know, when you should have been defended, when you should be safe. You have told yourself and you've informed yourself that, you know what, I have to be responsible for my own protection. Uh, and it should never be that instance, especially with a child. Uh, but ultimately what happens is as a child, you now uh, mature or you grow into adulthood and you're still informed by those traumatic events as a child. And you still, and the unfortunate thing is, is that if you haven't matured in that area, you still process things the same way you did as a child. And so uh, on, on a different platform, uh, a friend of mine that I share with a friend and, and, and a business partner, 
uh, we discussed a, a topic of anger being the only emotion that I know. Uh, and this thought stems from the acknowledgement uh, that many men learned uh, as kids to disconnect from their ability to express their feelings. All right. So uh, I'm tying this all into this, uh, this, this disconnect with the, the traumatic events. And so when we were kids, uh, many of us as men, uh, we were told to stop uh, crying, you know, because uh, crying and, you know, uh, you know, these things were attributed to, to, to girls, you know, to, to being feminine. And so, you know, if you would see a, a young boy crying, you would say, stop acting like a girl, stop acting like a, a sissy or something like that. And then ultimately what we did was we attributed those things to being feminine in nature. And so, uh, long story short, uh, even as children, because of the, the emotional, maybe the emotional pain connected with this adult, in many instances, a father or father figure telling you that, you know what, to do this makes you soft. What we learn to do is we learn to cut it off. Uh, one of the things that I, I try to caution a lot of people with, and, and listen, I'm being guilty of it myself, is, is that a young boy, uh, if they're, say, crying or something, telling them to man up, uh, while it might sound simple and it might sound uh relatively harmless in its uh, presentation, the reality is is that uh, that young boy is still a child, and so they don't know what it is to man up. But what, when we do that, we're planting a seed that says that men don't do what it is that you're doing. And so uh, I mentioned last week that even in my own family, and given an example, uh, men in my family, we didn't express love. We we weren't emoters in my family, and so what what we end up having is we have grown. We have men uh, who grow up not knowing how to articulate what it is that they feel, and as a result, they don't know how to address their issues in a healthy manner. And so, what you have within the context and the framework of that man is a man who knows that something is going on. But in his formative years, he wasn't allowed to discover the language that clearly articulates what it is that he's dealing with. And so now the, the language of anger and rage becomes the only thing that he knows how to demonstrate, because that was the only thing that he was allowed to give a voice to, because we, we, we attribute those things to being masculine you know, to be angry, to, to rage and to act out. But we don't uh, give opportunity and space to expand our, you know, our language as it relates to what it is that we're dealing with. And so I'm going to read, I'm going to do a little reading tonight. Once again, this comes from the book, Dear Son, uh, the words of a father to the heart of a son. Uh, this is actually in the, ch uh, the chapter that deals with, uh, let me find it really quick, I'm sorry. Uh, this is in the chapter that deals with uh, mindset. So this is in the second chapter, uh, and this is actually from the topic of perspective. Uh, let me share this. One common struggle for men uh, and challenges is anger and rage. Son, you should understand that anger is often more of an alarm or alert to what we are feeling an indicator that something is wrong. It is not the substance of what we are actually feeling. Therefore, it requires that you find the true emotion behind your feelings of anger or rage. Secondly, it requires that you manage yourself mentally so that anger does not become a phantom disorganizer of your mind. Son, hard things viewed in the wrong perspective often make us angry. That anger or rage is fueled by feelings of injustice, powerlessness, rejection, despair, humiliation, fear, or even insignificance. These fuelers are the things that we must be able to dissect mentally and find the opportunities rather than the obstacles in what lies before us. If you fail to identify the true fueler 
of your rage, it won't be long before you act out its product. The product of rage unaddressed is violence. Rage will cause you to commit violent acts against your own future and potential. The more anger and frustration you feel, the more disorganized your thoughts become. This warps your perspective and begins to violate your decision-making path. In other words, you begin to execute a series of bad choices that are rooting themselves in a perspective. And I'll stop right there. Uh, one of the things I want to say is that I can't tell you, and you know, I was thinking about this um, in, in, in preparation for this, this message, but you know, I can't tell you how many people that I know who have either killed, been killed, or went to prison because they haven't mastered their emotions. Um, and when you fail to master your emotion, uh, the real problem is, and the underlining uh, thing that we must consider is when we fail to master our emotions, what we're really saying is that we fail to master ourselves. Because we're given, uh, in instances, uh, we're given to things that are actually subject to us, but we make them our rulers meaning that I couldn't control myself in this fit of rage and the rage dictated uh, my next series of decisions. And so ultimately when we're young men not being able afforded the opportunity to learn how to process things, not given the example of what it looks like to handle frustration in a healthy manner, we grow up uh, left to figure it out in, in, in best case scenario, but in worst case scenario, we find ourselves being governed by things that we are actually supposed to be mastering. Um, and so last week, uh, I mentioned two of the major responsibilities that a father has in relation to his children. And I said that that was demonstration and affirmation. Uh, whether it's verbalized or not, uh, our children uh, reflect the lessons that have been demonstrated in the home. The father that rages uh, in fits of anger, by default, what he ends up doing is he communicates to his children, this is the way to elicit the response that you want. And so what ends up happening is, is that fear and intimidation, we learn that that's how we get results in life. And so for the one who who governs themselves by anger and rage, they've learned that in my state of anger, as long as I project it long enough, I should get the response or the result that I'm looking for. But what we fail to realize is that we're spreading that mindset to another generation of children, ultimately to our own children. I mentioned that the inspiration from my book, uh, it comes from Malachi, uh, chapter four, verse six, and I'll read it. Uh, it says, and he uh, will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Uh, remember, we acknowledge that one of the prevailing curses uh, in our land um, is that the, the wrong lessons are being spread throughout each generation. And so in this particular example, uh, with the, the father who rages and angers, that becomes the pervasive message for his children. And then if unaddressed and unchecked, that then subsequently becomes the lesson and the message that is taught to his children. And so, uh, you know, whether you're, you're a person of faith or not, you know, biblically, this speaks along the lines of generational curses, where one generation learns the bad behaviors from uh, it's a uh, previous generation. And then what they ended up doing is they become progressively worse because that becomes the foundation for their own normal behavior. Last week, and I'm getting ready to close, but last week we uh, spent a lot of time with the, uh, the distant father. Uh, once again, uh, the emotionally unavailable dad who uh, has reason within himself that uh, what they're doing uh, is necessary. And I said that, you know, one of the things that even I, I myself as a father, I've had to come to, to recognize is that 
I shouldn't be the one always asking my children uh, to make the sacrifice. Um, that as a man, uh, I myself need to find the balance between my own pursuits and my responsibilities as a both a husband and a father. And so tonight, uh, with what we've been talking about along the lines of this anger uh, and anger management, because the reality is, is that men, we as fathers, uh, when, when we find ourselves stressed and perplexed, angry and frustrated, uh, it's not that we need to let our children know what it is that has gotten us in that state, but we do need to start teaching them how we handle those issues in, in a healthy manner. Because the reality is, is that life does happen. You know, we, we, we can't skate through life uh, without experiencing some measure of adversity. But the real benefit is uh, arming our children with, with the wherewithal to overcome in those, those issues where now they become, uh, they're able to recognize that, you know what, I'm still responsible with my response. Yes, I feel angry, but I'm still responsible in this moment with my response. And so whatever it is that I'm getting ready to decide to do, I must recognize that, you know what, I'm making a decision. We call it split decision. Well, you can master that space within the split decision to make sure that you're making the right decision. And so this is a, a critical, uh, you know, critical piece for us as fathers who are raising our children, uh, who are raising our sons and daughters. Uh, you know, we have to show them what it looks like from our vantage point, how we deal with life's issues. But I'll close with the voice of the abusive father on tonight. And what I've been doing is, is that if this is your first time catching it, uh, this series, I have been uh, expounding upon a, a different voice of a different father for the past three weeks. And so uh, in this book, I try to capture the voice of five distinct father voices. This is the voice of the abusive father. Son, allow me to say what I have been unable to articulate in times past. In hindsight, I see things clear, and I recognize that I was extremely hard on you. Truthfully, and it pains me to say this, I was an abusive father. Son, I never meant to hurt you. I convinced myself that everything I did was necessary to make you tough. I figured that I was preparing you for the difficulties that you might experience in life. However, I know now that it was never about making you tough. The issue was that I was deficient as a father. I lacked control of myself and in fits of rage, you became the scapegoat for my inability to properly handle my issues. In all reality, I hated myself. And because you physically look like me, I took out my feelings on you. I have come to understand that my anger was a crutch. And in my frustration and inability to handle my wrath, I lashed out at you. Son, I am eternally sorry. And I hope that our relationship can be saved. Please accept this book as a long overdue apology. The Abusive Father. Once again, I'm going to ask that you do me a favor. Uh, if this has helped you and you see the value uh, in this series and these messages that we have been sharing over these past couple of weeks, I ask that you share this message with other men, uh, other people dealing with the wounds of fatherlessness. I want to also ask that you do me a huge favor, uh, and that is visit uh, www.dearson.net. Once again, that is www dearson.net on there you can actually order your copy of the book dear son the words of a father to the heart of a son uh, the book is available uh, not only on, on my online store uh, but it's also available on amazon uh, where you can get not only a paperback copy you can get the kindle version and there's also an audiobook version uh, read by a, a very distinguished uh, audio book author, uh, excuse me, audio book speaker. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I wanted to 
make this book available on all platforms because I want to uh, reach as many people as I possibly can with this. And I understand that not everybody likes uh, reading a physical book. And so uh, this this for this book, I wanted to make sure that it was accessible uh, to however uh, you prefer to consume uh, your material. Um, one of the things that I'll say, in, and I'll say this in closing, uh, I'm a firm believer that as men heal, uh, so will our communities. And so uh, it's my hope that as men, uh, we get the healing that we need. And in doing so, we'll begin to see our communities heal. Uh, I look forward to seeing you all next week. And thank you all for joining me uh, for this conversation, overcoming the epidemic of fatherlessness. Uh, thank you. And God bless. There is a prevailing crisis. There is a prevailing crisis that has crippled families and communities for decades. This crisis has a direct association to higher crime rates, increased poverty, and cost the nation millions of dollars annually. The crisis is the epidemic of fatherlessness. What would the world look like if fathers were not only physically present, but emotionally available as well? What would the conversation between the repentant father and the dejected son sound like? Recognizing that sons, both young and old, need to hear a heart of a father serves as the motivation for this literary work. This book is for those who need wisdom and guidance, never had those necessary moments with their father, or wish they had more moments with their father. Through the affirmation of a father's love, this book will traverse the difficult path from disappointment to hope, and from alienation to reconciliation. 